All right, is everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. Are you ready? We're, we're only on Saturday, but we're already getting to the comedy. <laughs> the whole point is to be able to laugh and grow with it. So you have it be very light and happy. And uh, this is a good movie because this is taking us into our next topic, which is guidance. So when you start to get your intuitive guidance, we've already established it doesn't have to be words in your mind. It can be signs and symbols. It can be funny things that happen to you, and you don't understand why these funny things are happening to you, but that's the humor of the spirit waking you up from this dream, and and the, the guidance is always going to be something a bit unexpected. In this movie, the guidance is very, very, very unexpected. The guidance will always kind of lift you from whatever role you're playing or whatever you think. In this movie, uh, the guidance will come to a man who is married. He's happily married, he has children, and he thinks he's a politician and uh, he's been elected. So he's, he's been given the role to be a politician in Washington, D.C., and then suddenly he's going to start getting signs and symbols that this is not the reason he is in Washington, D.C. at all. And, and the funny thing about this guidance is even when he resists the guidance, guidance is so strong and so obvious that he can't possibly miss it. It's funny, it's actually comical how the guidance comes in so clearly, so obviously that that's why this movie is a comedy because it's not what he's expecting and yet he has resistance, he has embarrassment, he feels awkward, all the things that we feel when we get guidance too. There's this ego reacting to the guidance. But yeah, it's so obvious that he cannot really fight. I mean, he does try. And that's part of the fun of the movie. He tries to fight the guidance. He tries to fight it with tooth and nail. He fights kicking, screaming, and still it's so obvious that he cannot miss it. So I think the point of this movie, really, since we've all just been here and we've just opened up and we know that, that guidance is clearly uh, important, is the message behind this movie is uh, trust and you cannot mess it up. You cannot get it wrong. You may fight it, uh, that's all right, that is actually pretty normal <laughs> in this world to fight the guidance. But actually, in the end, the guidance will take you beyond in, in a lesson of uh, trust that is so great that you can't really resist it. It's just too big of a force. So I think we'll roll our movie. We have Portuguese subtitles too, so you can watch it and hear it in English and watch the subtitles if you need to gain a meaning or something like that. And then we'll have a very lively discussion after. David, can I ask you something yes. for the movie? Maybe yes. you can talk a little bit how you use the movies for awakening. Uh... Yeah, well, I always noticed when with someone like Jesus, there was a lot of parables. And why so many parables? Because, because the teachings are so deep and so profound that you need lots of examples and you actually need some stories Sometimes they help connect the dots because the, the teachings are that profound. So I, early on, I just enjoyed movies and then uh, I began to receive this guidance that I was to use movies as like modern day parables because people could relate to movies. They were relaxed, they were comfortable. It wasn't like, uh, like they were seeing a therapist and they had resistance or that they were dealing with so much with their problems in a real direct way, which is to confront you, and then they could see some of their issues acted out in the movie and then they could go, oh, oh, and they would laugh at the person going through it and then they would start to, at some point, go, hmm, that's 
that relates to me. And uh, I think I was telling Mark, because uh, Mark loves the Matrix, and um, was talking to Mark and Natasha, and I was saying that initially, like when the Matrix came out, it was so impactful for me, and then the, the trilogy came out. And then at one point, I just asked the Spirit, I said, could you remake the Matrix? Could you get the Matrix back to me in a way that's even more helpful? And the Spirit said, yes, download all of the trilogy onto a computer hard drive, and then a friend and I were guided, we were not movie makers, but we were guided to an editing software, and we were literally, we had a new Matrix brought back to us from the original over six hours of footage, another Matrix came to us from the Spirit, which was one hour and 20 minutes. And it was very, we still actually have that movie. It's, we call it Matrix Redux, the reduction. And it was a mind-blowing movie because it took away a lot of the chase scenes and guns and bullets and it got down to the real core teachings and put it together in a way that it even added some new special effects on top of what the past few others at the time, my other sisters, <laughs> they had done. And so that was kind of, for us, it was like a sweet little touch too, but that began a series of, we call them mini movies, where we take um, very profound movies like Source Code or uh, we just have The Matrix, many, many, many movies, and we will make an abbreviated version just for teaching purposes. Then there'll be a setup and there'll be commentary during the movie. Some of them I call quantum uh, movies because they're so deep that they need actually a lot of commentary to decipher the movie, to take you on a journey. But people have had, and I've traveled around, people have had mystical experiences during the movie sessions I had because they're that penetrated with the commentary and the visuals together. There was a woman in uh, who rocked with this um, Meredith, um, Venezuela, yeah, that she'd been studying the course for 14 years, but she'd never had a mystical experience. So she was just hoping that God was real and hoping that this would work and hoping forgiveness would, would help her. And then when she was, I think I used that internal sunshine of this spotless mind with lots of commentary set up and commentary, and somewhere in the middle of all that, she she had her first mystical experience ever in her life, and then her tears were just steaming afterwards, and she came up and hugged me, and she's crying, and she's like, God is real, God is real. Just, <laughs> like a little kid who just discovered that it was actually an actual experience. It wasn't just a theological, I wish, I hope, I pray, someday, someday I might, experience. It was an actual kind of experience for her. And she said to me, you know, now my practice with the Course will never be the same, because with that kind of deep mystical experience, then she had more incentive to practice more, to give her whole heart over. But part of her was still, you know, holding back, thinking, oh, I'm not sure if this is this is going to really bear fruit. But then after the experience, it was like, that was the fruit. And then she was like, even more. And that's why when we talk about our experiences and what we've gone through and, and how it just goes deeper and deeper, then for us, living the experience is not like a, a high, kind of a pie in the sky kind of thing. It's just a very uh, basic, matter of fact experience of, of how you live every day. And it, it does take a lot of trust to be that transparent. Because normally people hold back a lot because they wear the mask and they, they think the mask is there for a reason, protection, but they don't realize that it actually inhibits you from opening your heart up. So it's a whole new view of uh, relationships, a whole new way of living. All the collaborations we do are very much about just one thing. So so we don't have that thing of productivity and time pressure and stress and trying to get projects done by a certain time. It's more of like a painting where there's a canvas and you splash some colors on and then you splash a few more on and it just, it just is 
in motion like a painting, but it's not like we're not trying to get to like an endpoint in form or a product. And, uh, and when we watch movies, we do it just for the sole purpose of, of healing. So sometimes we'll be in the movie and, and if you hear a lot of people reacting or there's some point, or you're having like a major reaction, then just put your hand up and we'll stop the movie and we'll go into it because you're having a big reaction. That's, that's good. That's something that can lead you a lot deeper, that reaction. So we'll be ready to do that too. Evan Homer. Sorry. Evan. Sorry. Homer. Homer. Is this Steve, Steve Carroll? Yes. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as you have your calling, then there will be signs and symbols that will come in and will be pretty strong and pretty obvious. And and even though this movie may seem like an exaggeration, if you had a month to spend with me, and I told you some of the things that I've experienced in my life, and the people who started to show up in my life, who were called out of being a CEO, who were called out of their professions, whether it's a medical doctor who, who was called to be a job coach, and now she's going into writing story, spiritual stories. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And the main point, I mean, when I was just watching this movie, at the very beginning, you know, they're putting up the credits, and they put, on the left-hand corner, I noticed it said in black letters, directed by Tom Shadyac. Has anybody ever heard of Tom Shadyac? Tom Shadyac uh, did I Am. He had a major uh, spiritual experience and after this movie. He did I Am. He this this one, Jim Carrey. Uh, movies, uh, Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty, which was all about God, undoing pride, dismantling the self concept, the whole. And I Morgan am. Freeman had one after this as well. He yeah, did the whole yeah. series on God. So the director. After this movie. After, after this, this movie. movie the director made I Am. That's the next movie that he made, which is an amazing movie. And he went through such a dismantling because when he went to Hollywood, you know, he had the typical aspirations to make movies, make a lot of money, live in a beautiful house, have a beautiful partner, have a beautiful lifestyle. And he dropped out of Hollywood. And basically the reason he dropped out, he said, the values and the direction, I was completely wrong about it all. He, and these were very successful movies. Jim Carrey, you know, and, and this one. These, these were movies that made a lot of money. I Am was more, he got into making a spiritual movie, and it really received a lot of acclaim for those. That, but, but he went through a major dismantling. Now, in this movie, the main character is going through a main you could say a major dismantling and this is this is quite typical when people start to get their calling first of all it puts a strain on relationships because it's way outside of the, the status quo of what the relationship was so for example his wife congressman baxter's wife you know he, she is just you can just see it all over her face she is thinking you're crazy, he's going to be depressed, why did you spend all his money on those eight lots? He starts to deny it. He's in major denial. He's using every justification 
He's trying to use humor. He's trying to displace everything that comes in. He's trying to use coffee cups, hiding behind things. And all this self-concept around body image, about clean and looking a certain way. He's now in a rope, and, and the beard's growing longer. He can't get rid of it. And even though this seems like a pretty strong exaggeration, actually, there's a lot of patterns in just what we've seen so far that are pointing to dismantling. I mean, I've lived in spiritual communities over the years, and I'll tell you, as people go deeper and deeper into it, they do, first they go through phases where they try to let go of all the tension that they put to the body, and sometimes they disregard it and you know, let it go, and then they realize that's not necessarily the direction either, and then that they need to look what is most helpful for to extending communication. So I've seen people who uh, didn't, didn't see it at first, but they are at, actually asked to blend in a bit with who they're trying to speak to, so that they can seem natural, because the ideas they're going to be sharing are pretty radical. And so there's a lot of different aspects of what he's going through and it's very much like a spiritual journey where you feel like in some ways like what is happening, my life is not my own, why all these um, changes, like what could possibly be the meaning, and I've had people tell me stories and things that have fallen away in their life, you know, from relationships to possessions to just jobs, all kinds of things that just things have fallen away in a very short span. And that also can be part of it. It will seem as if things are being taken away from you. That's another aspect of this. But in this movie, he is clearly, I mean, it's pretty overt with Morgan Freeman playing God and telling him directly what he's supposed to be doing. But he, you notice he's not speaking up. He's, he's had many opportunities to just be straight. And the reason he won't be straight, and the reason he won't say the words, and the reason that oftentimes people will not say things to their partners, or to their families, to their best friends, to their relatives, is because they feel it's too big of a change in their self-concept, and they will be rejected, or they will lose the ones that they love. That's a very, very common happening that happens with these spiritual undoings. So, at this point we could say this is, he's in a major phase of, phase of resistance, he's in, he's totally in dismantling at this point, he's still in a major cover-up, and uh, he tries to tell partial things, like what are you doing in building a boat, you know, he doesn't dare say he's building an ark, he's seen so, so many signs and symbols with Genesis 6, what is it, 6, 14, 6, 14. He's, he's uh, reading about Noah, and Noah had a wife and three sons, and he's just starting to look around, and he's in a phase of uh, denial and disbelief, actually, at this point. So he, he also, you could just say, is in development of trust, he's, he's very low on his uh, trust level. He doesn't see where this is going, and he doesn't see the value this at all, and he doesn't actually see a value in trusting this. At the beginning, when his wife was talking about prayer, you know, he's, but it's almost like, well, he, he has difficulty even opening to the concept of prayer, because it's so different from his daily experiences. You know, he thinks, well, I thank you for the house, although I didn't pick it out, and he's even kind of throwing some credit at his way, <laughs> even with things like the house, and things like that seem pretty obvious. So that's where we are in the movie right now. He's, he's getting at the column, and he's resisting it. And but he's doing it. He's, he's doing it. He's not trusting, but he's doing it. He's doing it. He's still, it's almost like when he shaves and the beard comes back, you know, he, he still he still goes to work. He's still going forward. So he is kind of moving. He's just resisting. The biggest 
the biggest issue that people have with spiritual awakening is, is the resistance to it. Because to the extent that you do not acknowledge it and to the extent that you deny it or try to push it away or cover it over or disguise it or whatever, uh, that takes an enormous amount of, of mind energy. And the more willing, the higher your trust level goes, and the more willing you become, then things actually go quite amazing and quite smoothly. Where it's almost like we talk about manifesting things, just show up, whatever you seem to need, and whatever would be helpful, it comes in so effortlessly. You know, there's a part in our minds that is like this the ego is very suspicious when when is somebody trying to woo you, is somebody trying to win you over to something, is somebody trying to convince you of something, you know, when stuff comes at you that quickly, the ego is gonna say, yeah, they have ulterior motives and you know, that's typical of its reactions because it it doesn't understand how important this is. Like this is for the awakening for everyone from the dream. So it's extremely important. And then whatever props, like if you were on stage play and, and the spirit said, I'll give you the props, your wardrobe, you know, house, people, whatever you need, you know, I'll, I'll send you all the props that you need to do this scene properly. And you would be like, you no, know, no, no thank you, no thank you, no. Then at some point it was like, just stop that. It was like Jesus said, that's me helping you, because I said I would. You, know, you have to let me fulfill my part, as he was saying, I, I will take care of you. Most of our upbringing is, is not to become dependent. We're, as we mature as human beings, we're not taught to be dependent on your parents. You know, we're talking about, the, who was it? Was it living? Somebody was saying, living with my mother. And I lived at home in the basement for, I don't know, 20, 20 something through university and everything like this. And I had to start to turn it around and see that that was a blessing. But I had a place to stay while I was reading, meditating, changing my whole perception. You know, it, it wasn't something to be embarrassed about. It wasn't something to feel awkward about. It wasn't something you, that should be difficult to explain to friends or whatever. Hey, what are you doing? Where's your house? Where's your apartment? I'm living at home with my parents. <laughs> well, spirit's like saying, yeah, well, considering all the transformation you're going to go through, you know, this is, this could be a, a safe 
backdrop for some major cleansing, major turnaround in the mind as you start to go in line with the spirit. It's actually a gift, and yet to society, it's like it's like a joke. You know, people are like you fail if you're living with your parents into your twenties. And yet, to the spirit, it's, it's all just using the symbols to let you go through this catharsis, this healing, this allow this darkness up, and it's, it's really strong. But that's that's really what goes on here. That's how it works. Things get given to you in very unpredictable ways, and that actually will continue on. Like we could, if we had weeks together. And I could tell you, tell you all the parables of the way vehicles have come to me, properties have come to me around the world. Each one has a, a long, intricate, miraculous story with every single one, with every single property. It's, there's unusual stories. With every single vehicle, there's unusual stories. With, with travels and trips, there are parables upon parables and parables of daily miracles, of things, synchronicities, things showing up. You know, it's it can seem like out of pattern, but then once it happens on a daily basis, then you start to just accept that there's some kind of big orchestration going on where the symbols are actually being brought to you for helpfulness, for ease, so that you can glide through time and space and keep your focus on, on your state of mind and not on how am I going to survive? How am I going to navigate? I mean, we've had stories where there have been time collapses where uh, a friend of mine, Kirsten, who was down here for the writing workshop, she one time was supposed to be going to an embassy in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland, and um, her mother was going to take her and it was a precise Time that she had to be there, and they knew that the morning traffic was so thick, so they set the alarm. But the alarm failed, and they both overslept by about two hours. And then they looked at each other and at the watch, just in horror, at thinking, Oh my god, we, we are going to miss the appointment. We're not even close to getting there, and it's rush hour traffic every morning quick rush out of traffic, and they, they hurry, they got dressed, they got there, they got on the highway, they were like one of the only cars on the highway, this like five, five lane highway, and it's bumper to bumper every morning, going into opera every single morning, and they got on there, and they just glided, 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 barely seeing another vehicle, went all the way down, it was like driving to ghost town or something, got there in time, a bit early for the appointment. And the appointment was perfect and everything, and then afterwards they were just totally baffled by why on that morning was the, the whole highway completely cleared when they needed that to make it on time. And then the on so they said, well, Tiger Woods was playing in a, a golf tournament and seeing off and everybody could <laughs> just see Tiger Woods play, play golf and it was that particular morning at that particular time. And those are like out of pattern experiences. Sometimes they've even had stories where where cities have been rearranged. Buildings, streets, you know. Sometimes it's easy to keep this story, right? Like, ah, it's time not to Same too. They were driving towards our monastery, and we just got out. It was pretty good to get out there. And they were driving, talking, chatting. It was nighttime, and they were really happy and everything. And then we looked down at the car, and the light, the fuel gauge was flashing. They were at the final stages of running out of gas on this long drive out to the monastery. And they just were like, oh my God, help. And then they drove just a little bit further, and where there was nothing was a, a gas station. And the name of the gas station was the Big G. That was the name of it. And they just they just looked out and they saw this giant G. And, and they went and they filled their car up. 
it's still there. I mean, it's uh, we go out there now, you know, we're always driving by the big But there's, it's almost like you're in a fairy tale, and the the symbols of the fairy tale all kind of lean towards you because you're willing to give yourself over to the awakening. So in this case, you know, you can just see it on his face there. It's a perfect freeze frame. He he's afraid, and he's. He has not come out. He has not come clean with the purpose yet, and, and it's going to be a bit difficult until he does. Well, it's it has to do with the self-concept. Like when the mind falls asleep and tries to make up another identity, it works so hard on this false identity in terms of intelligence and looks. And fitting in, and norms, and being normal, and being accepted, and being approved by the list goes on and on and on. And actually, it takes an enormous amount of mind energy to build this false self concept, because the whole world that we see and the personality self—they're all built in the mind, which is what we see and form as a projection of. Of belief, and at one point in the Course in Miracles, Jesus said, "You just kept on building and building and building, never pausing to ask yourself, why am I doing this?" He said, "Not only have you learned the false self, but you've overrun it. You've just piled it on. You just kept going in the wrong direction, and you just kept adding." More and more and more, and you actually got to the point where you believe more is better. That's the whole belief of the world. Better image, more stuff, more things, more is better. And and without ever pausing to ask, why am I doing this in the first place? With the total amnesia of being created perfect at the beginning, I'd say at the core, then. All this building of the self-concept has been running deeper and deeper into darkness, and that's why he says you cannot, at this point, you cannot judge your advances from your retreats. You're so messed up, you're so confused that you think you're gaining as you do all this work. And it's a famous Paul Simon song. We'll be done gliding down the highway when in fact we slip sliding away. It's a slip sliding away song. Building, building, building. Actually slip sliding away. Going into the darkness further and further. So in my travel in these 30 years in 44 countries, when it comes to spiritual awakening, it's it's actually the ones like I meet a lot of people in twelve steps that have been gone through extreme addictions, and their whole the wheels have come off their life. I mean, they they do believe my life is unmanageable when they get into the addiction so strong that everything starts to crash. But actually, when people go through major major crashes, that's like a crack in the mind. Like where the light can come in, and then they can cry out, get down on their knees, cry out. There has to be a better way. There has to be a better way to live. And then, with that huge crack, as everything crashes, they turn to spiritual awakening. They turn to healing. They they start to become more intensely interested in spiritual things because they start to realize that they. They played by the game of the world, and it was it didn't go anywhere. It just it, they kept achieving and accomplishing, and, and they never were satisfied at any step. They always wanted more. Okay, we're we'll see what happens here with Evan. He's a little frightened now. He's he's not. He's too Because when he. Did the beard thing, and he put the suit over the room. I don't know if you could catch what he said. Did you catch what he said? Competing. He was competing. The competition. Mm -hmm. What did he say? You were competing. He said the words were, and this was directed at God. 
he said, the student has become the teacher. He rolled back. He actually put on the suit to cover the robe, and then he said, so, so God could hear it, the student has become the teacher. And this is what that has been really given to me over the years is that this entire world is based on an authority problem. And, you know, we, we, we know that when teenagers rebel against their parents, we call it authority problem. When people rebel against police officers or politicians or lawyers or people who run prisons, we call it authority problem. And yet, if you go to the root of authority, the root word of authority is author. So basically, this whole world of time and space is a projection of, of an authority issue of who is my author. And, and do I have a spiritual author or do I have a time-space author? When you go to a bar and you're in a conversation with somebody and they want to get to know you and they say, where were you born? You offer your conversation your time-space answer for your origin. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your parents. You talk about your time-space parents. You talk about being raised growing up. The whole story. And all of time and space is a projection of the belief what? That I can offer myself. And not only offer myself, if we bring in the concept of reincarnation, I can offer myself any way that I want to be. I can be male, I can be female, I can be Egyptian, I can be Iranian, I can be American, Brazilian. It's all of time and space is an attempt to be the author of yourself, and then all of spiritual awakening is simply coming to the surrender of, I cannot make myself. I was created. I was, was given life in my creation. I have a spiritual reality. And all of my attempts in time and space to make up an identity that's apart from eternity are all part of an authority issue with the Creator. Not with the real Creator. Of course, the real Creator is pure spirit. It's just pure love. But even that, when the ego makes up its own God, and you've seen that in religions where it's, they talk about fearing God and God will get you and all these kind of things, consequences, and all that's made up. It's all part of an identity confusion. So, I was watching very carefully because he's, he's been carefully trying to shave the beard, he's been trying to gloss over things, cover over things, and then when he finally, you know, he handsome, beautiful, intelligent, and he's got his affirmations, and he's really, now he's got a, a, a executive assistant, a ponytail. <laughs> what are you doing? He's got a ponytail on the top of his face. He's trying to make it orderly, right, trying to fix it, trying to fix it, and fix it, and then when he finally gets the suit on over the road, which is way out. I was listening very carefully to what he said, and he goes, now the student has become the teacher. In other words, oh yeah? You you force a rub on me? The student will I'm become game. the teacher. I'll, I'll show you who's yeah. boss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to work in a row. I'll show you who's boss. And yet when he gets there, and he's asked, he's announced, and he's asked to stand, the suit is neatly folded on the table, and then he looks, and there, there he's looking right down my face. And so it, it takes you more and more. I think this is just very symbolic of the movie, where sooner or later we actually start to acknowledge that, that the stresses and struggles in our life have been generated by our own mind, and that we've been fighting against something that loves us so much it, it just adores us. It adores us as we really are. It, it sees our innocence, it sees our perfection, and it sees that we've been at a game, I mean a cosmic game, of trying to deny who we are. And then, if you look at the avatars, the saints, the mystics, and, and 
Jesus, that, that's just a representation of the surrender, like, okay, I will be as you created me. I will be love, and I will extend love. Even at the beginning of this movie, when the, the, the boy, uh, what's his name, Jonah, the, the actor, when, when the young man comes in and he basically says, I love you, it creates a big... Jenna Hill. Yeah, Jenna Hill. It's like a big scuffle, you know, and uh, the woman, uh, she said, I'm going to run a background, background check on that guy, and they, everybody kind of was taken back because... You know, in the political realm, it's not, um, except for Marianne Williamson, saying <laughs> I love you is not, it's, it's not really acceptable. You know, it's, it's way out of pattern. You know, it's, it's awkward. But, you know, we just saw that scene too. So now we're going to start to see him. I think it's just, it, finally at some point it gets to the point where you just start to surrender to it and you just start to say, okay, have your way with me, you know, allow this transformation, however it's supposed to go, I'm going to have, I'm going to go with it, I'm going to have some fun with it, I'm going to have some joy with it, and okay, let the things show up that are supposed to show up, let the things fall away, that are supposed to fall away, yeah, it's like you start to say, be you in charge, you know, you're taking me home, in the deepest sense, so I'm going to accept the symbols that come my way. And there's so many movies in our, in our collections that are always about that. Just dismantling, letting go, surrender. Somebody the other night asked me, can you, I want to show a movie to my group can you, in Lebanon. Can you recommend, I recommend that movie always with, uh, with uh, John Goodman, who's in this movie too, because it's such a letting go movie. And that's what she asked for. She said, can you have a good movie for letting go? Because I want to show it to my spiritual group in Lebanon. So that's it. That's what this is all about. That's what's underneath this whole thing. Typically, that's like a whole other topic that we can actually talk quite a lot about, but it's, it's manifesting. And, and a lot of people are into manifesting, and, and they do kind of... There used to be a show on cable TV called Arrested Development, and in one sense, if you get so much into the manifesting, then your spiritual awakening goes through a level of delay. It's, it's, first, it's used as an accelerator because it shows you you have power, a powerful mind. So it's actually extremely helpful in the beginning. And just like ayahuasca can be a helpful experience the first time, perhaps, for some, it actually, when you get, you get past that, it actually starts to be something that can be just misused. Uh, and it's the same with manifesting. You know, people try to manifest, manifest, manifest. But the problem with manifesting is the mind is still convinced that it knows what is helpful and what is best. And this mind is so confused, it's forgotten its source, that, that it doesn't really know the point. And honestly, manifesting is trying to take something from the past and change the form or bring it into form or into shape. Uh, and all we attempt to do is change the script. And use, yeah, authority problem. Use the power of the mind to change the script is basically what manifesting is. And once you go a little bit deeper, you start to realize that, that actually manifesting is impossible. That's, that's how you transcend the, the manifesting loop. So, I've always said, I always make jokes with the students over the years, like, well, you want to do really a poorly attended, unpopular uh, workshop, just do the impossibility 
a manifest that guarantees to bring this poor result in this world. <laughs> oh, very popular. It's not popular at all. And then if you want to do one that's even more unpopular, just do one title, Healing the Pleasure. And that will really, uh, you'll drop, everybody drops out of that one. But the thing about it is, these are the spiritual awakening insights that you have, where the answer, the antidote for manifesting is, is a work of blessing, that all things be exactly as they are. That's where the bliss comes in, that's where the peace comes in, where you absolutely are not trying to, as he was at the beginning, change the world, or fix the world, or make the world a better place, or rearrange the world even. You come to an acceptance in your mind, which is a new way of looking at the world, which is that all things be exactly as they are. It's like resting in complete contentment, and realizing that there's nothing wrong with the world, because the purpose in the mind that was given to the world, that was the power. That's where the hatred and the fear and the guilt were generated. It was in the mind. It had nothing to do with the world at all. So let's let's enjoy the ride here and see where it goes with our buddy Evan. He's, he's in the major surrender phase right there. It's all the symbols, the parables, to, to have the mind let go of the living room. You know? So it's like, <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> We're in the woods. The door, grab the door. <laughs> It's all symbols to let go. Oh, 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 yeah, that's interesting. You look, you look around. Interesting <laughs> shapes of wood. Yeah. Dave. <laughs> Dave. I didn't see that till that moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. David, just a slightly funny fact. I was at lunch with Roberto and Fabiola. I don't know. And then I was like, I really have a project that I, I want to be involved in. It's been hard because I wanted to buy a land to to build some sort of uh, what I believe could be a new sort of community. And the last thing I told uh, Fabiola before I got here, tell them that I was going to do what? I think I'm going to do that. Oh, really? Wow. 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 It's been kind of a, maybe a sign, I don't know. <laughs> and Fabiola, she works with animal power, so we know, like, I'm the lion, this is the eagle, you know, and she's wow. the horse, and, like, we all have our animals, so we are all in the flesh. And that's exactly what we're talking about, the animals, the pool, and then we said, I think I'm just going to be an animal. Wow. Oh my God. And in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the sound. Yeah. Well, it's, in some way, this already is an art, right? Yeah. Because it's kind of it's kind of serving the animals who are inside here. <laughs> well, it looks like an arc. Yeah. Well, yeah, but like the stuff that we're doing here, you know. I mean, it looks a lot like the art. <laughs> Surprisingly, like, I, I see there is a lot. There is a horse. <laughs> there's, an eagle. Remember there's, there's a lion. This, I think is what when God talked to the, his wife at the at, at the restaurant. He said, "Opportunity." The light. There we go. The light. Oh, the ark has lights. <laughs> it's already done. That's what God told you about in the movie. He said, "I'm going to build an ark." Here it is.
He was Morgan Freeman character playing God was saying God will give you opportunities. I mean and just think how powerful that is if you started to see every situation in your life, including this, as just an opportunity, not as a reality, not as a situation, but just as an opportunity to strengthen something in your heart by giving it away. And, you know, these symbols, I mean, really, it seems we're watching this and then all of a sudden, you know, there's one thing and then the stick and then <laughs> closing the door. I mean, what, what are the chances? There is, there is some kind of divine humor going on here. Really, it's really rough. I mean, when we first came here to look at this place, we didn't think that, but now we're all looking... Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I can hear some laughs. Yeah. 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 And, it's like, and the opportunity. This is like, and, and also, that's what part of what you've done is you had projects, movie projects, and you talk about it. The property project is something, it's just a backdrop for collaboration. And that's not such a minimal thing, you know, for, for people to come together from different backgrounds that, that have different interests, that have completely different paths in terms of form, and then to come together and to collaborate together. So for us, you know, with what we've been doing in our community, we have an enormous number of collaborations. We just wait for the projects to appear, and then we see who's who's in, and then we have a group of people say, okay, that's for me, I'm in, and then it's very guided and prayerful, but, but we live together, we work together, we feel that. And that's what exactly what he was saying, he said, we should, you know, it's a problem with Islam, so we just put it off, and then we have a lot of work around the spirituality, and people getting connection with that, and then we talk about the animal power, that is my work, all connected. So. Let's do it. I just have to let my beer grow now. Wait till the road comes in. Yeah. <laughs> we won't fight it. Feel like comfortable. <laughs> Well, we already have someone halfway, so I'm just going to use this one for now. <laughs> Stop shaving. Yeah. <laughs> oh. We are all there because of all these things. We are all here because of him. Yes, that's what you believe. No, that's what... That's what the universe wants. No, it drew the animals and you drew yeah. all of us. Yes. Here. Yes. Because it, 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 it happened in a very yeah, very strong invitation. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. And yes. we all come came here like we. Um, we didn't know. Wow. Well, yeah. well, it's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> we're building an ark. You should know. <laughs> you did all the time. You can do it. Claudia doesn't have clothes. Really. <laughs> 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 and like it was a training. Uh, uh, was a training for all of us. To receive this gift, and yes. right? yeah. we are so blessed. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I think this is just for saying. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. our quantum experience and that's that's actually how I come home because I think it's me, opportunity sent me an email and he said come <laughs> would you come if, if I would come and, and I said oh I'm not really traveling and I'm not going along and I, I took his mm -hmm. and he said at one point he, he said don't think of it as a retreat David think of it as a vacation yeah. <laughs> that's what he said and really, you know, that's like the message to our minds. Don't think of it as work. Think of it as a vacation. Think of it as play. I mean, that's probably for the program mind, that's the hardest thing to take in. Because it seems very fairy. It seems like some kind of fairy tale. 
because we've been used to working. It's like the, that's the program. We work and struggle for everything, yet I was invited, you all were invited, we all were invited by Luis to come here and, and we answered by saying yes. And then we didn't even know exactly how many would be here and, you know, we didn't know, we didn't even have a plan schedule for uh, the retreat. There was no program. We just showed up and said it's going to be shown. And we didn't plan to show this movie, but we were having our lunch today. We didn't even know about your lunch. Talk about the And we were talking about what was happening with the environment as well. That's why the arc came together. The idea of uh, that what's happening, people so blind, and a lot of the government people are voting to let us know what's really happening with the environment. That was our decision. <laughs> we, we had two movies in mind. We had two movies in mind, and we said, when we went to lunch, we said, we'll see which one stands out. And then Jeffrey told us, this is the movie that has the Portuguese subtitle, the other one doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's shown. That's like, the reason. God has, like, a, a message. This is the one. Yeah. Well, that was the reason. Yeah. 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 If this is happening, is also because Fernanda put it together. Yeah. 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 If there was a knock, she was the one who punched the nails. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Before I came here too, I did get some pretty strong signs of repurposing. Like when I was coming down, I think I, I saw somewhere, I think it was in a magazine or something, where somebody had bought a, a large Boeing airliner and he had the, the, uh, the engines taken out and he had hauled up to Oregon in the woods and, and put into the woods and he he repurposed the airline, the airline to uh, his home. So he, he lives in this big plane. And then I think I know it was a magazine at this place or something. I, I saw I was going through something the other day and I saw this beautiful uh, place. I think maybe it's down here in Brazil, but with these two boats that were on top of a cliff that were overlooking the juice. <laughs> it, it was like these big they were there were buildings that were built in the shape of boats. And they were kind of right there next to each other and there was a long walkway and, and I was just laughing at them. Well that's repurposing. But but I think that's the important thing to remember that that it's not like you have to reinvent your life. It's because that's what this whole world is. It's an attempt to keep reinventing the, the self-concept and making a better one, making a good one. But it's repurposing. That that's all that we're asked to do. That is the new beginning. That's the, the whole new turnaround in our mind. Is we simply repurpose. We give everything in our lives. So it's not sacrificial. It's not saying you have to cut this out. You have to stop this. You know, we wouldn't go for it for that, but repurposing by giving it a new purpose, it starts to make everything lighter immediately. You start to look at everything. You don't think of, of a job the same way. You don't think of an encounter the same way. You don't think of your relationships. In an instant, you can start to go, wow, how would my relationships feel if they were repurposed, if they were given another purpose from, from getting trying to get something from someone, which is expectations, disappointments, heartaches, heartbreaks. You know, we know the game of getting always has consequences of failure. You know, we, we set up the getting mode in our mind. The ego is the getting motive. And then the giving mode, how can I share? How can I extend? How can I give? Even with, with Luis and Fernanda saying, this I want to do, I want to do a retreat. This is the invitation, this is my gift, this is for my mind, this is for my healing. How I want to invite friends, I want to invite people that I know. We were talking too at the lunch break because um, 
Kristen and Jackie were down here, and they were just saying, most any other country, it doesn't work to just put out invitations and say, bring them on, whoever you are guided to bring them on, because it's sometimes it turns into a very strange mix. <laughs> but but if you look at this retreat, there's there is a deep calling, there is a deep shared purpose underneath, and I think that's why it's been so harmonious and so deep, and why the tears could flow easily, and why the, the healing could come so strong, you know, with the, everything we've done, the movie, or talks, or the music, everything is just meals. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's precious. It's really precious that we can do. We didn't even get to the end of the movie and yeah. already. <laughs> Well, also, the very end of this movie is one of my favorite endings. Not just the ending of the movie, but as the credits roll, they are got Tom Shadyak's in it, and they're playful, and yeah, so I think when we let it roll now, let's ro let it roll through the, the glorious credits. You don't have to stop for the credits, because it's really, that, that's just one of the best endings I've ever seen. The movie. It stayed with me for weeks or months actually when I first saw this movie. Can I ask one question? How, did, how does it help to get it, the, the script is written and the, the freedom of choice? Well, there, there really is no freedom of choice in the world. So, so human beings are under the great illusion that they actually have choice. And The mind that's asleep, basically, the only reverberation of, of heaven, the only reverberation of free will is that you can choose one of two purposes every single moment of your life. You can choose fear or love. Mm -hmm. And the only choice is fear or love. That's the only thing that's left. So everything, that's why the psychics and dreams can be seen ahead of time, the scene that seemingly hasn't happened is seen in a dream. Nostradamus, very famous, saw things centuries before they happened. He couldn't even, he didn't know what the missiles were that were flying through the air that he saw because they hadn't been invented. They weren't even close to being invented yet, but he was like reading into Akasha, the Akashic records. So the psychics don't see the future, they see the past. They just read the past. So for years I've been teaching this, and I, I have different ways of describing it. Like with my students, probably back in the 1990s, I would say there's the past past and the future past. And the reason they're both past is because the, the whole world, we're told in the course, is, was over long ago. You simply are reliving something that this entire world is a deja vu. And we have those kind of deja vu moments, you know, how did that happen? But, but this entire world is a deja vu. There's even one point where Jesus says, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. So suddenly, once you start to get the feel of that idea, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present, then your mind suddenly perks up and becomes acutely interested in, okay, show me what's going on in my mind. Because of the perception of a human being, the way it seems that the past is over, the future has not yet happened. And I remember growing up, even as a child, because my mother was a history teacher. And so, uh, when I got to, to seventh grade and eighth grade, I was not, the rule in the school was you can't have your parent as your teacher. So there was two history teachers. So I was given Mr. Herbert, his name was, instead of my mother. But then I started to really realize that when you go to history class, they put that chalkboard and they put that big arrow on the, on the board and they put the arrows on it and then they put the present moment in the middle. And then they go back through history and they describe the different eras and everything. And then the more I studied the Course, and the more I worked with Jesus, He was saying, yeah, that's a trick too. 
the, the, the present moment that everybody's searching for, even all the great spiritualities, it's not in between the past and the future. The present moment is before time was. Mm -hmm. the, the, you think you're moving forward in time, but you're actually moving back. It's almost like if you were on a beach over by the ocean, and you know, the footprints in the sand where you tracked all these things, that's like your history. But actually, in your mind, spiritually what's happening is you've got a broom, and you're stepping backwards on, through those footsteps, and you're taking the broom, and you're cleaning, you're leaving the smooth sand in front of you, that when you forgive, you actually are going back in time towards the present moment, which is perfection before this world of time and space happened, because it's an invention of the ego, all of time. So, when you start, some of you were wondering, like, what is this Course in Miracles that are asking about the workbook lesson the first day? Like, what is this? There's lessons? You can, you can use lessons? There's lessons in this book to train your mind? Yes. Jesus Christ has developed 365 lessons, one lesson for every day. And, and guess what it's to do? It's to undo all the beliefs you have about time. That's what the workbook's designed to do. And think about it, the happiest moments you've ever had in your life, the moments of play, the moments of joy. Remember when you were a child and you were playing and you lost track of time. You lost track of the passage of time. You, you lost track in the joy and the glee, you lost track of the movement of time. And that's why in the Bible it says, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to that playfulness. You have to go back to that joy, that glee, that play. You have to go back into that spontaneous moment in which you don't understand anything about the world because the world is an invention of the ego to keep you from knowing who you are. That's what the Matrix was all about. The Matrix is designed to keep you from knowing who you are. And think about it, when you have regrets of the past, that's always because you you believe something went wrong, you did something wrong in the past. David, I need to say yes. something. Yes. I'm sorry about it. Yeah, you're ready to burst. I have a sharing moment of the activity before. It's almost like you're saying exactly what I told her. It's like, seriously, I like every word I was just telling her how I miss this exact feeling that literally you like say the exact words like she she started looking at me like laughing about it because oh my god I just can't believe it and oh god <laughs> no what what Wait, 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 we have to discuss that just very carefully. Yeah. Okay. Very carefully. Yeah, you know, I didn't ask a question because this, the court says to ask a question really is a, an attack talk. This is what Jesus says in the book. So you have to be careful not to ask questions. But all of them. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but. I'm ready for the but. <laughs> but well, other than that, I, this is a question that I've been, been, you know, struggling my whole life. So let me make it very simple, okay? Okay. Okay, so we go back to our lives and we say, geez, I should have done this differently. You know, I did all, all these mistakes. I, you know, I should have called someone. I, had, I should have put more effort in my, in my work. I should have uh, uh, whatever I should have done. And I'm trying to, I'm starting to understand that that's not the case. Because the court, you, to, today you said very clearly for the first time, which I loved it, you said there's no possibility of, of uh, uh, 
What's that? Choice. It, what? Choice. Choice. No, 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 no. You, you, you cannot, you cannot... Um, mess it up. Mess it up. No, 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 no. <laughs> you cannot... We have to go through the replay. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you, you cannot create. You cannot... You cannot create. Manifest. 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 Yeah, exactly. Manifest. You cannot manifest. So that's great. No manifesting. <laughs> so, no, no, for you, no. Wayne Dreyer and so many guys that, you know, manifesting, manifests. They silent, very silent, you know, the book and I read, manifesting, manifesting. So, bu manifesting bullshit. So, what? <laughs> manifesting bullshit, okay? Yeah. You can okay. Now, now, the last... <laughs> You're on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Bumper sticker. Last one, no, but now, the now again. All the, the guilt that we have, all of us here, have a lot of guilt from the past. Guilt related to our, you know, our relationship with our mother, with our sons, with whatever, you know, because we should have done differently. If the script is written, we could not have done differently. Right. That's it. Well, that, to believe that something could be different, anything can be different, is, is to believe in hypotheticals. So, I've done whole talks to say that the only problem that there is is the belief in hypothetical thinking. What is hypothetical thinking? When we think of hypotheticals, imagination, imagination as if, you know, like, as, as if I had not said that to my mother when I was 25 and broke her heart. As if I could have done, sit, taken a different career path. I should have become a, me a doctor. As if I could have been a doctor. As if the course could have come to me 20 years before. Sooner, before. Uh, as if, as if. But as if implies that something could be different than it was. But the script is written, and that's the whole key to spiritual awakening, is you start to realize that the only reason that there's a belief in hypotheticals is there's a belief in time. Without the belief in linear time, there would be no such concept as hypothetical. I mean, I've had people come to me and they'll say, okay, I get, David, this is all about peace and love, but just speaking hypothetically, uh, and I get these kind of questions. I remember one time when I was in Florida and I was traveling with this woman named Beverly and and uh, that was that was the famous parable where I was at the church and they invited me to lunch so I went to this church it was a big long table and there was like 30 people at the table and I was sitting down across from this man who was they said hi what's your name and he said Fred and then we talked about five or ten minutes and then I said Fred you should, I did what you did, I invited I said, Fred, we're doing a gathering tonight, you should come to the Course in Miracles group. And the whole table went, oh, the whole table at once. When I issued the invitation, oh, they all groaned, and I, what, 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 what's going on? And they said, no, you don't want Fred at the gathering. I said, yes, I do. And they said, no, you don't. If you knew Fred, you would not have invited Fred. And I said, tell me what's going on, and they, they all, Fred said, I know, this happens every time. He said, I won't come. I said, no, I want you to come. And they said, he said, no, I, I, I ruined the group. Uh, I ruined the group, so I really, you probably don't want to invite me. And I said, no, no, come, come, come. Then, the more I asked people what was going on was Fred was a philosophy professor at the university there. And Fred would ask questions at the Course in Miracles group that nobody yeah, in the group could answer. And they were good questions too. There were questions around judgment, like how, how can you possibly function in this world without judgment? You know, we're good. This was a philosopher who clearly given his whole life to it. And then... I have a friend in my group. You're saying, you have a friend. <laughs> So Fred, I said, no, Fred, you really need to be there. And then I shared the first half of the gathering with the, all the, the deep teachings and lots of examples and everything. And Fred was completely quiet. And then they took a break to have snacks. I saw Fred, and I went up to him. I said, Fred, 
don't you have any questions? And he said, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> and he said, but I'm being polite to not ask my questions because I don't want to ruin your, your gathering the meeting. I said, no, but if you stay silent with your questions, that's, that's not helpful. You're not helping anyone by, by being quiet and holding on to your questions as if they're secrets. So then I said, Fred, we got a whole half of a meeting. After this snack, I want you to cut loose. And so Fred's first question was, he said, you're traveling down here in Florida. I see you walking down the street. And you're walking with your friend Beverly you came with. And he said, and here's my question. A guy comes up with a knife. He grabs Beverly. He puts the the uh, knife to her throat. Now tell me honestly that you would be defenseless <laughs> in that situation. And, and he really clearly put out a hypothetical scenario. And so when he asked the question, I said, well, thank you Fred for asking your question and speaking up and what you've just given me is a hypothetical. All fearful situations, all scenarios we have of, of people dying, people being harmed, sick bodies, cancer, heart disease, heart attacks, everything that is considered terrible, disastrous, kidnappings, you know, on and on and on, is all generated in one instant from the ego. All potential harmful situations, we'll say, and that was one of them, is, is generated from the ego. And there's, there is an answer in your mind. There is another way of looking at the world. And that's why Jesus was so defenseless. That's why he never defended anything. Even through the, the crucifixion, and even as the, it was a nice story too, because it, it, the body came back, it was a resurrection, it was a symbolic story, and you can't really kill the Christ. The Christ is not subject to the laws of, of time and space because the Christ is, is still one with God. That's why he said, before Abraham was, I am. He was again pointing to the present, before time and history, the present moment is prior to that. So every time you give your mind over to a miracle, which is really what A Course in Miracles is about, it's like saying, he says you're way too afraid of, of light and you're way too afraid of love. You think you're afraid of things in the world, but that's a projection. You're afraid of who you are. You're afraid of that divine light that you really are. And that's why you get so busy with careers and relationships and all these dramas, because you're afraid to be still. Like, be still and know, know God. that I am God. You're afraid of be still and know that I'm God. So you you generate a huge layer of complexity to guard against that one thing. So, if you begin to understand that, that hypotheticals are impossible, because cause and effect are actually together. The ego split cause and effect apart, because God is the cause, Christ is the effect. The ego said, no, Christ, you've left God. You blew it. You fell. You fell from grace. You separated from your source. Okay. Cause, God, effect, Christ is, is separate. And then it projected out a world in which, in time, the cause comes first and the effects come second. And everything in science, everything in every, everything you would study at a university has one erroneous belief. Behind physics, Remember physics, for every action there's a reaction? Mm -hmm. Not really. If you, if you went to learn how to, to bake, and you had to bake, learn how to bake a pie, then you have to learn time, and how long, and the temperature, and how long you bake, and everything. Auto mechanics, all, every discipline there is, are all based on false cause-effect relationships, because that's the big trick of the ego. That, that the cause comes first and the effect comes second. Remember when we were growing up as children, if you had sibling, you made me cry. Mom, he hurt me. Remember, you know, you come and then one comes in trailing behind the other one. I did not. Yes, you did. 
And I told, I'm telling mom, and I'm telling dad too, and you know, and you hurt my feelings, and you make me mad, and just think of the, the, the projection, even in the language that little children use, you know, there is this sense of threat, like somebody did something to somebody else. So the whole thing that's underneath all that is this belief in hypotheticals. And that's the, the teachings of Jesus, is that cause and effect are together. You still are as God created you. That's a workbook lesson that he repeats actually over and over. I am still as God created me. I am not a body. I am free. That's part of the, the lesson that you have to give your mind over to. And that's what really even is the goal of meditation, is to go so deep in your mind, to get so still that you come to an experience of light. And, and many people have done that. There's even like, like Vipassana is a very disciplined uh, pathway for meditation. And Vipassana comes from the Far East, I believe it was Thailand, where the first Vipassana Vipassana meditators came from. But they had like, a, a, I remember, I think Francis showed me, the, it was an article where all of the Vipassana meditators come together to kind of compare notes, like how's your Vipassana meditation doing? The fascinating thing was when they came together, they would reach a point where they would go down, down, down into their mind, and these are the, these are the pros at the meditation, and they would reach a point which they would say was terrifying. They would sink in their mind to a point where they would compare notes, did you reach that point? Yeah, it scared the hell out of me, I don't know what it was but it's like a wall. And Jesus describes this in A Course in Miracles. He said, if you go into your mind deep enough, you will, you will encounter the ring of fear, he calls it. And he says, there's a ring of fear in your mind that generates, projects this entire world. But if you went down, which meditation is about going down beneath the sights and sounds of this world into your mind, you would encounter this ring of fear. That's what the Course in Miracles is aimed at doing. It's like reaching your internal guide, reaching your internal teacher, and, and being guided down and through the ring of fear. Even workbook lessons that literally are guided meditations where he says, sink down beneath the riotous sights and sound of this insane world to the kingdom of heaven below you. Even at one point he says, uh, in terms of the Bible, it says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he says in the Course, actually the word within is unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. It's, it's not a place. It's, it's, a, it's your identity. It's the light. And so the whole point of mind training is it, it doesn't matter what you done, what you didn't do, what you studied, what you haven't studied, whether you feel your beginning of your spiritual journey or, or to near the end, whether you feel you're a beginner or advanced, all of that is just part of the static that's to cover over the light. And once you come, I mean that's the value of a retreat like this, is it's just giving you a context to say, this is important. This. I'm doing this for the whole universe. I'm not doing this for a personality or for a group of people. I'm going down to escape from illusions. So to complete my question, my, <laughs> my, this is easy, it's not easy, it's bad or less for me to understand that this difference. So you said, you know, there is no, that, that you, you cannot, you know, hypotheticals are bullshit. Because you know you cannot do anything. So, so everyone here that is guilty about something that they've done in the past, they are guilty for no reason because they could not have done differently. Okay. Even today, what happened today was already written. So there's no no way. Now the other question is, if you if you do a miracle, if you do a miracle yourself, okay, are you able to change the form or not, or just you're able to see the light and express the light to your brother or or to 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 heal someone for instance but are you able to to uh, to uh, to change the form no 
the script is written and there is no possible change possible in the world of images. However, you can change your mind. Mind, okay. Mind, okay. You can change your mind. Yeah. And the second part that's important with that is the world is not outside your mind. The world is inside. It's in your mind. And you have the power to change the way that you look at that world, the whole way that you perceive the world through the power okay, of, of okay, your mind. Okay, I got that, I get that. So if you look at different way, then you could look at the forgiven world. And then, you know, you will not see any problem. Like the blacks or whites or, or any problem else. Because you're going to see from above the battleground and you're going to say, okay, get that. But you, you're not able to change the form. Because I'm always looking for to change the fucking form. See? And I'm never able to change the form. Yeah. Well, the what about the saving time you mentioned yeah. yesterday when we do the, yeah. the only choice yeah. you have? No. As you, every moment that you choose a miracle, it's like you, you save time, in, you might say you shorten time in your mind. So the time that you, one way of putting it is, Jesus says, you still believe there is a time that must elapse between now and the time that you forgive. You see, it's no different than, remember the gurus that would say... Can you repeat that? There, it's, you still believe, he says, that there is a time that must elapse between now and between the time that you forgive. So, so you see forgiveness in the future. And it's no different than the, tra that's the whole trap of enlightenment, is that as long as it's believed to be in the future, if I meditate for eight hours a day for who knows how many years, it's like there's a hope that eventually I'll reach a place of forgiveness or stillness in the future. And, and what Jesus says is that, in the section called the immediacy of salvation, is that that future happiness is not your dread. Your fear is, is the present moment. You're, you're not really, future happiness is not your goal, it's your real dread is of the present moment. You're, you're terrified of that moment where you can change everything. Mm -hmm. You're so terrified that that's, what the, that's why time was invented. So, really, this fits in with what we were talking about, about the art. This fits in with, I mean, you know, we were talking about the glee and the joy and the playfulness, like as a child and everything. Because that childlike state of mind, that playful state, is not trying to change the world. When you go into that moment of losing track of time, you do not have a purpose to change the world. And then Jesus comes right out and he says, seek not to change the world. Because I was an activist, and I know a lot of you, you know, of course, that's that's a phase we all go through where we, we go, there has to be a way to, I, we can make a difference, we can make a change, we have to make the world a better place. You know, uh, Michael Jackson, you know, he had a song about, yeah. you know, making the world, the world, the world, make, it make it a better place, place, place for you and for me and for the human race. But then, he came out with, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. <laughs> I'm asking him to change his ways. You know, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. You know, there you see how even Michael was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. First about make the world a better place, la 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 la, then ooh. Take a look at yourself. Take a look at your mind. Take a look at your mind and make the change. Even Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Gandhi was on to hear the thunder rolling. He's like, oh my God, you guys yeah. are listening to me now. He's, it's like, so once you just get the slightest hint of this, that all that effort you were putting into the world, we'll say the construct, you start to realize, I'm not interested in the construct anymore, because the construct is an image that was put there to trick me into trying to look outside myself 
And Jesus says, Seek not outside yourself, for it will fail. And you will weep each time an idol falls. We've done it with relationships. We've done it with the environment. We've done it in hundreds of thousands of different variations. We've tried to change the world, not realizing we're trying to change the effect. And the causation of this world is, is in the mind. So you have to change yourself. You have to change yourself, and you have to try to get to to to, to have more the mind. purpose. The purpose. Okay, yeah, the purpose. purpose. That's all. The purpose is not anything. My last question. Okay, last question. Jesus says in the beginning of the course that that the course can save you time, right? Save you time. Me meaning, you can get to this point of enlightenment quicker than you would do if you would not. Forgive, for instance. But that's all you can do. You can get to the place of, of, of enlightenment quicker. You can be in a place where you feel total peace. You see the world from above the battleground quicker if you do the forgiveness or the work that we're doing here. Right? No. Even quicker is a, is a trap. You're just still putting it in time. Because and it's, enlightenment is now. It, it's and still, time was created by the ego, so you could postpone the work. The, the ego can turn quicker into a big stress. <laughs> oh, well, change the work. They're you quicker can, than, you know, I mean... But uh, Jesus said that you, well, can, you can save time. Yeah, and so that's that's a symbol. But what, that, what he really means by that is he's saying you can change your perception of time. So that's what we want to focus on. So what he's really saying is, he's not like saying that you actually, that's, those are kind of metaphors, like the, I talked to you about the celery and chopping it up and collapsing time, bringing the alpha and the omega back together. Those are metaphors, but in the end, think of it this way. If, if you had a choice between seeing time as linear or as simultaneous. The one that will bring you the peace is simultaneous. Okay. So some of you have heard of like past lives or future lives or parallel lives. Some of, that's a big topic, you know. There aren't parallel lives in the sense it's all simultaneous. All of time is simultaneous. That's what quantum physics is showing now. There, it's just all energy, it's all connected. And there's no way to make distinctions in the quantum field about the past or the future. They're, they're basically, the scientists have discovered, they think it's very mystical, mystifying, but it's actually, it's, a, it's just because it's all simultaneous. Now just for a moment, think about how relaxing your mind can be if you start to see the world as simultaneous. And of course it goes against all the programming, we know that. But think what that would do to your worries. Think what, what that would do to your coulda, woulda, shouldas, you know, if only I had been a better daughter, a better son, a better mother, a better, a better neighbor, a better something or other. You see how that's hypothetical, he's saying that the past is somewhere back there and it wasn't good. It, it, was, right. it was not good. And that's where the guilt comes from, this feeling like something terrible has gone wrong. But it's, it's in the mind, it's not in the form. The ego invented the body, so the ego invented all these memories of the past. And people have said, well, you know, I like forgiveness, but, but I just don't think, you know, like a serial killer deserves forgiveness. Why not? Doesn't everyone deserve the same forgiveness and innocence? If it's just one problem, wouldn't you want to see the innocence in everyone? And that's, that's how it works. In fact, there, there was a man who uh, is in prison. How many years was Dale in prison for the? Sixteen. 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 Six years. Six years ago, he's in. He's he was a boxer, a professional boxer who on uh, ESPN was a, a pretty well-known boxer, and he he murdered a guy named Frank, and he's been in prison for sixteen years. Well, some years back. He somehow, I don't know the story of how, do you know how he even got my books into the prison? I think it was Holly that sent the first one. Holly, his wife, 
sent the first book in, and I think it maybe was Awakening Through a Course in Miracles, very deep book, and he had time on his hands, he was a captive audience, and so he poured himself into this, and it, like the movie Hurricane, on, about Hurricane Carter, where who was devoting himself to Krishna Murray and teachings, he has gone so deep that that was one of the things we were talking the other night about, Lewis was saying, now that would be a movie to make, because now has he, he's not only gone through all this healing himself, but I was referring to him on online retreats, people started writing to him, sending him letters, uh, Jeffrey's had an ongoing correspondence with him, and he had recently was facing the, the victim's sister, mm -hmm. in that context, and so he had to, Jeffrey was working with him on the idea that, that he still believed he had to pay his debt, pay his time for what he had done wrong. And, and Jeffrey was like, well, maybe you want to look at that victim idea. And he was actually able to come to a point where he could forgive himself for everything, including for that. And then his, his, uh, the victim's sister reflected that back. She, she was joyful when he came to that moment. So now he's applied for early, early release, and we're thinking, we sh we've got to turn this into a movie, just because it's such a beautiful story of innocence, and coming in a practical way to come to innocence, and, and feeling that innocence, experiencing that innocence, feeling clean and clear and absolved. So that's the key, though, is is just starting, to, he just started to zoom in, in his mind, to this idea that I can change the way that I perceive the world. All you have to do is have that belief, just the willingness for that belief, and the Spirit will take it from there. You don't even have to figure out how, you, you will be given the how. Okay, got you that. Last question. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> what happens in the miracle? The you said that was the last one. one. No, what no, happens no. in the miracle? What happens? You talked about so many miracles. What happens in the miracle? The miracle is really simple. It just simply sees the false as false. So you were asking, does it change the form? Does it change the world? There's nothing so simple as just seeing the false as false. There's nothing so peaceful as looking upon the false as false. Because you must be looking with something that is very holy to be able to see it mm -hmm. that way. It, experience it that way, not just say the words or have some kind of mantra, but to really, so that's, forgiveness is quiet and, and quietly looks upon the world. It, it looks and waits and watches and judges not. It's, it's like a silent, peaceful observer that simply sees the world as false. Why is it false? Because the ego made it. Because it wasn't created. It, it actually was not created. It has, and it, some people say, well, where did the world begin? Was it the Big Bang? You know, the scientists are looking for, it, it doesn't, if it, if it doesn't have a reality and it wasn't created, it can't have an existence. It's like a, a, a what's it, um, Einstein called the world an optical delusion of consciousness. That's what Albert Einstein called the world. It really just lines right up with Jesus in the Course, you know, yeah, yeah. It's an optical delusion of consciousness. When you're dreaming a dream at night, and you have what seems to be a fearful dream, the, the only problem is you believe that it's real. That's the only problem. You, or you believe that it's happening while it's happening. But if you were aware mm -hmm. that dragon could let the fire-breathing dragon, let those flames come out of the nostrils, let let it look however it would look, but it could not harm you unless you believed the monster was real. I have a question, like a practical question. Uh, since, you know, marriage or like, like all these concepts, we create them, right? So how do you see sexuality, sex, relationships, and marriage in the eye of this egoistic because I mean we have the concept of like you know dating and then you know yeah. and getting married and like there's we this can look at the concepts but basically what you could say is 
the, the spirit will reach the mind exactly where that mind believes it's at. So, it's like when Jesus came to earth, you know, if, if he was just going to give all the teachings compressed, he could have just, he didn't have to do the whole birth, and well, he could have just materialized, big crowds there, and he says, this world is a dream, it's not real, you need to let go of valuing it because it has no value whatsoever. Just be still and know that you are one with God. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. You know, the Truman Show, he could have done the, the Truman ending. But he came as a demonstration, and that's why even there seemed to be all those miracles, many, many miracles surrounding him, because he was in a state of mind that didn't take any of it seriously, and, and knew that there, these were like symbols around him, healing, bodies healing, raising the dead, even the resurrection coming out of the tomb, those were all just like little symbols, because they're still part of the dream. So even that resurrection story, which is a pretty famous story, you know, he came to roll the stone away, and he came and saw Mary Magdalene first, and then he saw the apostles and everything, that's just another story too, but those were just symbols of like pointing way beyond the dream. You know, it wasn't like there was anything special. Sometimes Christians really do want to make Jesus into something special. In, in A Course in Miracles, he said, no, no, I'm like your elder brother. You and I are the same. We are completely equal. He's saying, if you really want to go beyond equality, there's the only thing beyond equality is awe. You, you've heard of awesome awe. He said, that is reserved for our Creator. We are the same. I am no different than you. I am absolutely the same as you. In time, it seems like you aren't ready to accept our equality. But you will. And it's inevitable. And I'll wait. I'm, I'm here to just teach you, instruct you, all about just one thing, to see we're the same one. There's just one Christ. There's, there's not many Christ. There's just one state of mind that we're going for in enlightenment. So, that's the whole key. And then when you, when you were talking about, like, families, marriage, children, sexuality, all those kind of things, they're all concepts. But, we started to go into this the other night when we were talking about the, when you have a an ego belief system, and you have a preference system, you know. If you took just one topic that you mentioned, let's talk about sexuality. So here's sexuality, and now we have asexual, homosexual, bisexual, Trans transsexual, I mean, it's an expanding field. You know, I was reading a couple weeks ago about asexual, I thought, they were like, yeah, they don't really have a lot of, of attraction. There's occasional bits of attraction, but they're basically not typically attracted, asexual, but I was reading about that. But, but the whole field of sexuality involves what? Preferences. If you took the preferences out of the field of sexuality, it would collapse. Imagine if you had no preferences in that, but also you took it out of food. Nutrition, diet, mm. you see it, that would collapse. And then if you started to look at lifestyle, you know, I want to live this lifestyle versus that one. If you took the preferences out of it, it would collapse. So this is the answer to your question. The Spirit knows even your preference system. And, and yet, when you have a prayer and you just say, help me, I still am so I, I, I'm circumscribed, I am circumvented in all of these preferences, ego preferences, reach me, then the Spirit will reach you with, give you a function, give you uh, projects of collaboration, opportunities for joining, lots of opportunities to choose again in your mind. And then part of that is, as you go with that, then those preferences, I say, get met in terms of whims. Not because you personally are trying to go out and earn your way, and build your lifestyle, and build your image, and 
chase that dream. But it's more that when you get into that surrender of giving yourself over to the Spirit, then those things do still come into awareness, but they're all, they, they start to loosen. Where you start to realize that present peace is your goal. And you're not searching for experiences that relate to the world, you're actually searching for peace of mind. And then you do get a lot of whims. I know, you know, at the beginning, we were kind of talking about that, Mark was talking about like, uh-oh, we were talking about two purposes in the mind, and uh-oh, this is, it, it can seem threatening, but if you start to realize that, that along the way, as you just make this lean towards opening to spiritual awakening, that even the things that are part of the ego belief system will come to you in very joyful ways, because the Spirit is like saying, thank you for giving your mind over to this profound, most important calling that you could ever have. And, and they come, but they don't come from like individual pursuit. They come, it's like gifts raining down. You know, I've had so many stories where people will tell me they, they have a particular preference for a particular kind of food, or a candy bar, or, or a partner, or soulmate, or anything, and then they go for God, and then all of a sudden they've got so many stories to tell. But how does that, that, how does that preference and taste um, relate to what you said the other night about um, pride, pleasure, and attack being the ways to like strengthen the ego? Because like yeah, the purposes of the ego. Yeah, yeah. because that, that okay, like candy bar gift, okay, like nice sex gift, but that's pleasure. So like, where's the line between like ego and just enjoying the path? I think the line is that if you feel that you're a person who's trying to per pursue, or I'll use the word get, things then that's the very mechanism that has to get undone, to come back to giving, to, to truly giving like as God gives, without any conditions. Unconditional giving is, is another way of describing love, it's unconditional giving. So, in order to loosen the mind from the getting mechanism, it, Jesus is saying it's, it's too terrifying. It would, it would be, I'll give you an analogy, if, let's say, you're a parent, and you're in the living room, and you've put your child to bed, but you start hearing muffled kind of noises and screams uh, coming from the bedroom. And so, you think, I think my child is having a nightmare. If you go in that door, and turn the light on, and you go and start to shake the child to wake them up, there's a pretty good chance that the child will perceive the shaking, because the child is, is dreaming. And the child is dreaming something that's horrifying. And if all of a sudden you go in, turn the light on, and start shaking that child, the child may perceive the helper as the monster. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may even increase the fear if the child is being shaken. Maybe the parent says, I'm, I'm trying to wake them up as fast as I can, but it can't be that fast and that harsh. You have to have a gentler dream. Jesus is saying, you aren't going to go from nightmares to light. You won't go because you're too terrified to go back to that light. You need a phase of what he calls gentle dreams and happy dreams. Mm -hmm. And there's a gentle awakening. So that's what I call synchronicities, these these little whims, these out of pattern things come in where you think of something, you, you talk about an arc at lunch and then you watch a movie that has an arc in and then you look around suddenly as the lights come on and you go, it's, you know, those are like symbols that are part of gently saying, ah, see, that wasn't that cute, wasn't that fun, you know, you get these little flashes. So it's more like the parent hearing the the cries of the, of the child in the nightmare, and going in and finding the most gentle way to wake that child up, so that 
so that it's not interpreted as, as an intrusion. If, if the mind starts to feel that there's an intrusion or that there's a coercion happening, then it's going to shut down. And it will actually turn, its, turn away from the light if it actually feels like it's being coerced. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so gentle, bringing in all these miracle experiences to gently take you in a pathway where you start to see, oh, it's, it's, there is a soft way to wake up. You, you have to wake up through like a soft, gentle dream. So it's like relating with pleasure as a receiver and not an achiever. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that's a receiver. You can, you can see it. It's almost like, oh, you know exactly where I'm at and you know I still value something. And I didn't go after it as a goal, but you still gave, gave it to me anyway, without me going after it as a goal. And to me, that's why the spiritual journey is not a, a journey of deprivation, because, you know, everything, like we've enjoyed things like travel, and meeting people, and smiles, and laughters, and sharing movies like this, and hugs, and we, you did the eye gazing, or the, uh, Diets today, we we have done we have this one thing called angel bath that we've done. We've done lots of experiential things where people crack open, they cry, they they feel love. This angel bath is like having a row, two rows lined up like angels, and then some people walk through that and people whisper in their ears, they stroke their. But this is this is so powerful. It is. So <laughs> oh my god! I cried. Yes. That's what they do. Some of these people have never been touched for 20 or 30, 40 years, and then they go through the angel bath, and they're just, they're just this crying, and they're just like, oh my god, what, how? I had that literally like two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh my god, it was like in a male retreat to cure the male father type of yeah. energy, yeah. and so it was only men, wow. like 20, 20 men. Two steps, and, me, and I just turned into a little boy. That was one of your first questions: was how do I get out of this intellectual idea thing? And you—that's what you—that was your prayer. You said, "I, yeah. I want the experience." Now you tell me you just went to one of those retreats and had that. You see, that was a—that was an example of what Mark was asking. How how does it come in? Still involve touching, still involve sensation, but somehow it kind of opened up this really deep sense of, of love. I mean, even when we were starting, we had the movie screen set up, and then all of a sudden the blankets went out, and then, oh, can I squeeze between you? And, and oh, like, oh, look at this little cuddle party going at the front there, and this and that. Because deep down inside, people like a cuddle party. But, but like, okay, so like, no private thoughts. Uh, <laughs> The, the first reaction I had was like, okay, so the end of seduction, okay, so like no active seduction, seduction games, you know, and not just sexual seduction, but like many other ways. Business reasons. seduction, yes. yeah. But, but then my, my following thought, yeah. Thanks, God. my following thought was, Mark, we love this, you're doing this for all of us, we need this. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, because we are, I think, okay, I am addicted to the seduction game, both in money, opportunities, sex, and like everything, like, um, so I thought like, okay, so that's the end of it, because that's the getter kind of like strategy, but then my next thought was, what if, what if, what if it's, it's a guided impulse because like I seduced Natasha <laughs> and it's like the best thing I've done you know yeah. oh. and like I felt like go get her you know just like and <laughs> and that's the only reason why we're together and, and it's like the big treasure you know so it may seem like that on the surface <laughs> but remember there's a destiny everyone who's meant to meet is meant to meet I just watched a movie with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and Yoko was talking in current day terms. She said, I, st I now believe 
that the only reason that John and I came together was for the song Imagine, which was voted, actually, the song of the century. Now, how's that for a different perspective on why we met? You know, for the, for the song of the century, that, that is so spectacular, because the one blessing to actually see that the reason they came together and the other thing I would say in terms of you, you're taking it pretty hard on yourself because you're saying, I, I enjoy this game of seduction in many ways and this and that. Well, I would say, let's flip it around. What if the Holy Spirit, I'll say, is, is given the task of waking the mind up and the Holy Spirit has to find a way to seduce the mind back to the light and the Holy Spirit is the one doing the seducing. And the Holy Spirit is the one that brought you and Natasha together. And the Holy Spirit's the one with that playful laughter, even when the ego tries to do so its thing. Right? Yeah, through you, yes. Using and through you. actions. Yes, through you. Using actions and using your mind. Like the Holy Spirit is this loving, playful, joyful presence. So, so... Everything is okay all the time then. It, is, it actually is. That's, what, whatever my that's, mind. What, that's his point. That's what Roberto's point. That's his main point he wants to make tonight. That nobody has ever done anything wrong. The only point. choice you have is to perceive it differently. It's, it's, the, it's the ego belief. That's what the only. So I don't need to be like cautious of like when it's the ego speaking because it's the Holy Spirit using it. Right. If you have a prayer in your heart to heal, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest. You you have to get out of the equation and stop obsessively saying, "Look at Mark. Oh, ah, oh, did you see the look he gave Natasha? Ah, he's playing the seduction. You know, there is no that critic is not the Holy Spirit. I'm doing that all the time. Yeah, but and the Holy Spirit loving you all the time, absolutely loving you and and really working to convince you of this higher calling. But you're not really doing anything wrong. Because it's the Spirit that is using all things to this higher purpose. And Natasha has something important to share. No, I, I, have, I have a question. Thank you. It's a little bit about the form that you brought. Um, okay, so... If there's no difference between inside and outside, why does my mind and my ego change and the world I see, this illusion, doesn't change with it in the form, the form itself? And that's the thing, because, okay, it's a little bit about what I've been studying, like I'm an architect, and I, I, I'm really bothered about those walls. I mean. Every, every construction for me is based on the triggers of the ego. It's like for protection, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, okay, so I'll maybe loosen up, but then everything I see, even though I can um, change my perspective or whatever, or the name I give to this uh, barrier or whatever, um, it's still there, and it's not helping me perceive different levels, or you know what I mean? Like, bringing me higher. It's only stuck in the same place. Like, why is this material world, this form, stuck in the same way? And we are only the ones doing the work. You know what I mean? Like, if it's the same thing, why is it intact? Well, I would let's say that eternity, which is no beginning, no end, no time, let me call eternity change less. It's, it's changed with by its very nature. So the ego itself physically can change, and so is the world. Of course, the world really acts it out. It's like an emotion picture of this belief in change. What is the change that the ego believes. It's the belief you can change your identity from the identity that you were created as in an eternity to a time identity. So the only way that you can come back to changelessness is you 
you had to see the impossibility of change. Now, that, that can seem like, on the surface, like, whoa, that's a big one. In this world, I'm supposed to see the, impo the impossibility of change, and it's actually, that's actually where it's all heading, because what Jesus wants us to do is, he wants us to see the impossibility of attack. The reason why Jesus was so meek and calm and quiet and friendly and, and the way the Spirit is, is because Jesus saw the impossibility of attack. Now let's start to look at that a bit, because attack and change go together. And attack, what does attack require? But it requires an attacker and an attackee. One who's doing the attacking and one who's being attacked. You see, this is how the ego is so tricky. It takes, it protects itself in the mind and projects out the world and goes, oh, there's the evil one over there. We caught him in the act. There the attacker and there's the, the victim. There's the attackee. And so, when you want to actually see the world in a different place, Jesus says there's one remedy. You have to start to realize that all judgments in the mind are attack thoughts, even the positive ones. So when we say, that's nice food, that's really good food, that implies that there's such a thing as bad, bad food. <laughs> good food, bad, you're in the restaurant business, you know, how many 15 restaurants and you want those restaurants to serve good food, because the business stays moving, because <laughs> there's good food and good service and good nutrition and all those kind of things. It's like the formula. That's the formula for good restaurants, you would say. But Jesus is saying, yeah, stay with me. I've got a purpose for you of forgiveness. But it's not the old way of forgiveness. You're not going to forgive people for what they did. What do you mean I'm not going to forgive people for what they did? No, he said, you're going to forgive people for what they did not do. Oh, you see now, he's raising the bar. Uh, he's he's saying things like, you know, you may try to overlook the behavior, but the behaviors, the good behaviors and the bad behaviors aren't the problem. That's the projection. It's the thoughts that are the problem. And that's why all authentic spiritual paths are really a purification. Do they require discipline? Yes. Do they require mind training? Yes. We don't try to gloss over that and just say, just click your heels together like Dorothy, and just keep clicking your heels together and say there's no place like home, and just say it as many hundreds or thousands of times as you need to. No, this is actually about practicing and choosing the miracle. What I find is it, it, it even seems to be faster when you do it in a relationship, because the mirroring is much more intense, and then it's even more so in community. You live with 25, 30 people. You think there's opportunities to forgive when you're living with 30 people. You better believe it. Try doing it for 30 years with a bunch of people. And in one sense, some people, I mean, I've even had spiritual teachers saying, the way you're talking, that's like a nightmare. That's my worst nightmare, is to have a group of people who are trying to practice spirituality. That's there was this, a Course in Miracles teacher and another one, uh, Gary Renard one time, went to uh, Ken Watkins, another older Miracles teacher, and, and Gary said, I've been traveling around and all I can say is the Course in Miracles students are vicious. They're just the most vicious people I've ever seen. And Ken said, yeah, stay away from them. <laughs> you know, but in the sense that, that for many people they wouldn't touch this with a tenth of pole because they, they say relationships are so complex and so sticky and they it's more like they like the old ways of going to the cave or go out and live in the forest if you're going to really go to God in a quick way. But no, Jesus is actually saying, yeah, the ego made it to be very complex, but if you have a different purpose for the relationships, you can turn the tables on the ego and the very thing it made to trap you to be the very thing that releases you. And that's a whole different perspective of 
relationship. That's what he calls holy relationship. So we are meant to use a pathway of holy relationship. And he actually mentions different pathways to God. He talks about contemplation, and he talks about fighting against sin, and he talks about long periods of meditation. These are the traditional ways for centuries that people have sought God. And Jesus says, yes, yes, they are tedious and time-consuming. Jesus, in the Course of Miracles, calls the most traditional ways to God tedious and time-consuming. He doesn't stop there, though. He says, your way will be different. You are given a means of saving time. That's what Fernando, she just left it. That's what she decided. Saving the time. And, and that is through what he calls holy relationships. So there is a way through relationships to come in the most direct way to God through forgiveness of removing the projections onto the partners, onto the people that are in your life. And he says this can go really fast if you really get this and go for this. It's going to be fast. Yeah, just to... Uh I don't know if it's a question uh, on the line of Roberto's and Mark's question about um, obviously using the movies Guide to the Lightning. Uh, there is the Groundhog's Day, which is in Portuguese, uh, Feitiço da Marmota. Feitiço do Tempo, Dia da Marmota. Dia da Marmota, Feitiço do Tempo. And, uh, and it, it, just to, to get into over the idea of space and time, and you keep living the same day over and over until you perceive it differently, and then you move to the to, to the next day. And and the, in another line in the, in the Matrix that we sp- talk about many times, when he's talking to the Oracle and, and she tells him. Uh, you didn't come here to make a choice. You came here to understand the choice you made. So that, to me, is it's when you have those clicks, it's when, I don't know if that's what they call the holy instant, but I think, that we, at least me, when I experience making the same perception over and over again, when, when I can change the perception, the feeling is that it's almost like a treasure hunt when you crack open a, a, a different stage and you can actually move to the next day. But what you, t- you say about, you talk about this uh, happier dreams, but the course also talk about how long is an instant. So is it about when you, when you, you can actually, everything can happen in an instant that you can actually remember who you are, is that it? Yeah, it, it only takes one instant to remember who you are. And then if you really look at what that means, all it's saying is, if you can just give everything you perceive, I mean, the stars, the black holes, the, the rain, the, the people, the rocks, the mountains, the trees, if you can give everything that you perceive the same purpose, then, then you are in, you're in that instant. What that means is, like for example, if you looked around and I and I just said to you, what's the purpose of of a glass? Or what's the purpose of an iPhone? What's the purpose of sunglasses? What is the purpose of what is the purpose of an orange bottle cap? Is it a cone? You see there's an association here between this thing and this thing. See if you've got the little orange thing. And so what Jesus is saying is everything you perceive in the world, you've made false association. Like this thing right here, we could call it like a little, like a small little paper. Okay? In the workbook of the Course in Miracles, Jesus actually said, you could receive the vision of Christ. You could go into life. If you withdrew every meaning that you've given to a table. He actually uses a table, not even a person. He uses a table in the workbook, and he says, you could receive the vision of Christ, the greatest gift, 
spiritual vision, not, not this kind of vision. It's these eyes, these eyes are not, these are idol makers, you know, these are image makers. They are not, that's not vision. But he's saying, if you remove everything from that. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like the Buddha too? Remember Buddha said, empty your mind? You know, wasn't that his teaching? But imagine you start to supply the teachings of Buddha and Jesus just to this table. What you would do, you would have to let go of all concepts of texture. You would have to let go of all concepts of, of essence. What, what, is the, what is it made out of? Of, of height, of length, of width. You would have to remove everything from this table. Color. Everything you could think of. And think of it. What what would a table mean? Oh. It has associations with this thing. Because bodies tend to put things on tables, don't they? But those are just memories. So what he's teaching, and I, I remember I was in Australia once, I had a I had a, a water bottle with a blue bottle cap, and I spent like three hours doing a teaching session, and, and, and the, when they put it up on the internet, the title of the session, The Blue Bottle Cap, because that's all I talked about for three hours, I talked about a blue bottle cap. And I talked about it in the context of let's use it for spiritual enlightenment. Now, why is this important that we clear our mind of all these past associations? Because it's like a whole menagerie of complexity. You know, I was in the College of Design, Art, and Architecture for five years. In architecture, you look at all kinds of things. You can look at visual things, interior, exterior, structural things especially vectors, you know, there's so many things that go into the field of architecture, but if you were willing to empty your mind of everything you believe about anything, uh, about a glass, about a table, about a bottle cap, why is that important? It's because that moment that Lewis was just mentioning, that important moment where there's a significant shift and change in the mind, is you have to make space for forgiveness. Like forgiveness is another way of looking at the world. But as long as you have old ideas, old concepts in your mind that you have associated, then what it does is it blocks what's really there. You can't see it as it really is. You know, even studies they've done where they say you just use a fraction of your brain energy and, and your perception is such a tiny little sliver you don't see the radio waves, you know, unless you watch the movie Lucy, you know, if you're Scarlett Johansson, she, oh, she can, she's only got 24 hours and she's going like a sky, like a rocket into enlightenment and she, she's picking up telepathy, she's picking up all the different frequencies, you know, she's, she, she has memories of when she was a, a baby and, and she remembers the tears and breast milk and she, she's got all this memory coming together but basically you have to clear your mind you have to empty out the past association to make way for the present memory and that, that requires trust that's why we talk about guidance how would we how do you go about your day without guidance how do you go about your day without trusting that there's a higher power there's an, an internal teacher that you have that loves you so dearly, that knows your own best interest, and knows that you believe you're in a labyrinth or a maze called time and space. And because you believe you're there, oh, there are decisions. It's not even pretending there aren't decisions. They're not real. In, the, in eternity, they're not real. There's no decision in oneness. We'll trust that there's a side between us in pure light and love and oneness. But if you believe in duality, then you perceive yourself in time and space. And then you need guidance. And that's why we talk, I mean, basically every retreat we do, we always seem to be ending up talking about guidance. We talk about how practical it is. You can call it your intuition. 
you have to make contact with that guidance. You have to gain confidence in that guidance. You know, we were talking about even the guidance to, to travel to another place, you know, to travel to another city, another country, or whatever. We did a gathering Wednesday night in, in Sao Paulo, and uh, Juliana was, was our translator, and Juliana was translating for me, I think, the last, at least the last three that I've met here in Sao Paulo. And afterwards, she came up and she said, I'm leaving Brazil. You're leaving Brazil. And she said, yeah. And the guy went to go, and said, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to Switzerland. And I said, I have a dear friend who lives in Switzerland. She lives in Zurich. Where are you going? Going to Zurich. So I went on Facebook, and I typed out a message on her page with his name, so he would be tagged so they could bring them together. That's the purpose of everything, is the guidance, is the connection, connecting the dots. Because that's how you follow and trust. You start to realize that, that no day is a random. That every decision you make, you're either making it with the ego, which is where you experience upset, or you're making it with the spirit. Every single second of every day. Now you're not aware of this, because most of the decisions that you're making are unconscious. And, and that's why it's so important to raise the unconscious up into awareness. But wouldn't it be amazing if you could raise your unconscious beliefs all the way up to the light so that you weren't making any unconscious decisions? You were completely conscious of every single decision. That's where I like to talk about Paramahansa Yogananda. Because there he was, and sure enough, He's sitting around like having his last supper with everybody. And sure enough, he says, it's been wonderful. I love you. And then he took his exit fully conscious, you know. And uh, you mean the guest. You can imagine the dinner guest. The, the disciples guessing because here he is making the decision. And what was Yogananda doing for us? He was demonstrating the potential of our mind to even choose the exit point. So death is not the grim reaper who comes with a big, a big long black book to snatch you away when you don't even know. But imagine being so fully conscious that even your exit from this world is nothing more than a conscious decision. Now that's what that's why we do the mind training. Because we don't want to be at the mercy of hidden secret beliefs. You know, that's why we raise them up. Um, as you, you're talking, you, you have to have discipline to be awakened and to enjoy and see the things guided. Because there's this oneness and this whole consciousness, and there is. Uh, like the ego made it up, made this world up. So it's like, let's wake up and let's see the thing beyond the ego and see it as a child, as a, as a child, as they are together. But is, is there a place, that's a, a question of mine, maybe my ego, uh, where I, I cannot even need to transcend ego anymore. Like I'm doing like this thing here, I'm awakening. Or is there a way for me to not get trapped anymore or not having to transcend it going more and just rest after I make like that's a story, maybe a Christian story that I made in my life, like how that yes. that I can I can just be there and not be trapped in this ego shot, even being awakened like I'm seeing illusions, I'm seeing this as a dream, I'm, I'm, I'm being guided, but is there a way to just be free of being, of, of having to transcend the ego, or I'm already transcendent and it's all the same time space and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving everything together, I'm already free from it and being in it, it's all together. So. Yeah. Yeah, I have this expectation of some, somehow yeah, yeah, yeah. become just like... Uh, yeah, so it's almost like 
I remember when I was a kid, my mother used to make this dessert called Jello One Two Three, where she'd mix it up and it would have the Jello would come out of three different layers. One was like Jello, one was more foamy, one was real foamy, and then you got the big down to the Jello. Well, the perceptual world of believing you're a human being will say is 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 egoic. It's the wrong mind. It's that. Then there's another level that's very, very peaceful, and it's called the happy dream, because there's no death in it, you know. And right before you come to the happy dream, there's, there's an approaching happy dream where you still seem to be making decisions, but there's a part of your mind that knows, I've already done this, it's, you know, you're just watching what seems to be decisions, but they aren't really, they don't feel like decisions. Like, like it's almost like involuntary. Like, you know, you're watching them playing out in an involuntary way. And, and that, Jesus has a name for all of you know, his, his regular ego consciousness, he calls it wrong mindedness. Then this one is just, when you're getting close to the happy dream, that's called the borderline. He has a whole section called the borderline. Where the border still, what? The borderline. Line. Borderline. Borderland. Borderland. Yeah. That's the borderline. Then the happy dream is is what you're describing. No judgment. You still see. You still look upon uh, the world. You still see the images. But your mind doesn't break them into little categories. Bottle cap, glass, person, floor. Shoes, sandal, you know, it, it doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have all these categories anymore, which are the judgments. It's just got one category, which is the forgiveness. It's the forgiven world. And then there's something even beyond that, which is pure life. It's creation. Wrong mind, borderland, right mind, creation. It's just pure life. And that's the, that's the order that they go in. So, for example, let's say you start to just let go of all concepts and you start to experience the world in much more of a miraculous way with things, if you think things and they just show up. If, if you have the slightest need, you know, it's like something shows up as a symbol, like, no, it's, it's that. There's, there's not this time I have to work to make it happen. There's not the time gap. And, and more and more, that gets to be more of the borderline. You just things flow very easily. Everything is very, very easy. And of course, you feel, we'll say, more happy, more consistently happy, when everything is not a struggle. And it just gets easier and easier and easier. It's, it's, you're becoming more consistently miracle-minded. You're, you're seeing the world in a much more miraculous way. And then everything starts to be like in the flow. Like and you're just, you're just in the flow. And you see everything in the flow. Everything is the main. And then the goal of the Course is not the life. Because Jesus says, you, you don't teach or learn the life. The life just is. It's, it's not subject to learning. But this happy dream is he says it's a phenomenal learning accomplishment. That's, that's what most people call it, coming to self-realization, to really coming to that still state of mind. And that's our shared goal. It's amazingly, that is the one goal that all of us share, is that high state of mind training. Do you, do you consider that you are the best? I, I find that my mind is very consistent. And then also I find that, that that's the only purpose. It's the only purpose that I'm capable of sharing. That's why, why would I travel except for this? Why would I write except for this? So you're at the happy dream. It's a very happy you yeah, feel like. feel, feel very consistent. That's why I, we were talking earlier about the idea of not having a bad day. There's somebody who's asking, me, oh, they're still over those 20, 30 years, there were these flashes of suffering and pain and things that can come in. But not, it doesn't touch that consistency. It's like a, it's more like a, a glimpse here and there. 
And, and that's the whole purpose of everything, it's just that, that monitoring. So that's why, like on the internet, we put, we, we have movies of commentary, we put all these teachings. It's our joy to share and extend this because we share the same goal, you know, for this monitoring, you know. It's really one of us, so it's like all that you give, you're just strengthening and reinforcing in, in the mind. There's no competition, there's no this or that, and, and in the end, even this idea of levels of consciousness, that's, that's more of a well. It's a happy dream, we're all about that. That's, that's why no one really can do wrong. That's very comforting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this talk. I love it. Uh, uh, uh. It's my joy to see your face. So happy. I, love it. I come all the way down to Brazil just to see that smile. <laughs> no gift. No gift. <laughs> you look like you're three years old and Whoa. you just discovered. It took, it took a, a very heavy you know, weight from my, from my shoulders. <laughs> Incredibly heavy. Thank you, spirit. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're close to dinner time, but we're also in Noah's Ark. Yeah. <laughs> we can hear the thunder and the rain. <laughs> umbrellas. Yeah, umbrellas. Are they umbrellas? Yes, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Even that choice to just say it's, it's, it's still like, for example, I said the, the choice can exist, but, you, but if it's all mine, you don't. There really is no exit. Like people, one time they said, you know, what happens when you leave the body? And they said, well, you have to, you have to presume that you went, were in it in the first place before you can, you can believe you can leave it. You have to believe you're in it, and that's a belief. So, yeah, even that decision is not the decision we're talking about. We're talking about a purpose. And even that, just like Jesus when he, the stone got rolled away and the resurrection, that was a body. His teachings were really resurrect your mind. Free yourself from the ego. Don't, don't even be concerned. That was, just, that was his contribution. He said, I was crucified because that was part of my contribution. He says, you don't have to make the same contribution. He's like, that's, that's the last useless journey we call this, you know, to the cross and, and all that. But also, this idea, too, that, that we have a purpose that we can share, and that purpose brings us joy. And we're on a journey of discovering and embracing that purpose. And then you start to realize the form it's it's not, it doesn't matter. You know, that's lesson number one in the course. Nothing I see means anything. And he says at one point, the only value that anything has in this world really is to point you towards eternity. The only value that anything in this world can have is a contemporary, it's like a little symbol that points you towards eternity. Which to me is happiness and joy. Uh, Somebody just wrote to me uh, just recently and they said, aren't you into celebration? And I said, yeah, that's, I am. And, and that, imagine living in a kind of a, a feeling and attitude of celebration. And, and consistently, you know, such a gift. You know, that's such a gift. And it's felt. People around you will feel it. You know, they will feel like, yeah, I like, I like being around this. I like being... The thing was, when I got into the courts and started trailing around the country and around the world, 
I had no plans. I had no plans to be a teacher. I had no plans for a spiritual community. And I just was happy. And, and then when I traveled around and was happy, then people started to say, can we live near you? And that was not a plan, but from an architectural standpoint, you know, that was like a spontaneous, can we, can we live? And then people started kind of living closer, and that's how we seemingly had these communities, just because people wanted to, they would say, let me live together, I want to live together with you, and, and I said, oh, okay. And then, you know, it goes up and down, and that's just a, the purpose underneath. Okay, well, I think it's dinner time. That's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you.